all good can anyone can everyone see my screen yes all right so good morning and thank you for coming to this uh, open release and seminar uh, of our Sydney Digital Twin modeling work that we have done in the last few years. And this time we're actually um, doing a presentation of the collaboration that we also had with Arid Systems in terms of data feeds. Um, my name is Simona. I'm a senior lecturer at the UTS um, University uh, in Sydney, and I'm leading the Future Mobility Lab. And the plan for today's presentation is going to be structured um, in the following um, steps. First of all, I'm going to provide you with an introduction of who we are uh, and what we do at UTS. I'm going to pass on to uh, Adam Berry, our Deputy Director of the UTS Data Science Institute, to tell you a little bit more about the, all the interesting things that we are doing inside the Institute. I will then pass on uh, and introduce to you uh, Bill, um, the CEO of Average Systems. Uh, after that, in the second part, um, I will start um, introducing and having a presentation about the work and the motivation that we had for the Sydney uh, real-time digital twin platforms. And I will also hand over to, as I said, our uh, background digital twin um, specialist, Dr. Yu Ming Yu, for more information with regards to the architecture of the platform. Um, in the third part, I will hand over to Bill. He's going to talk and present about um, the ARIS system work and also about the TIF technology and um, utilization. And then I hope we can wrap up in about half an hour, maximum 40 minutes, and then we can get your open question and discussions um, so that we change a little bit more on that. Um, so that being said, um, Adam, uh, I will pass on to you for a short intro of who we are at the Data Science Institute. Excellent. Thank you so much, Simona. And um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be a very small part of what I think is a, a really interesting presentation and what I think of as an excellent opportunity in this space, which is how do we better integrate diverse data assets, potentially real-time data assets in ways that are visually appealing, deeply useful, and that link in um, some cutting edge data science technologies. So the, it's a great topic, really interesting work has been done here in collaboration between the UTS Data Science Institute and ARID Systems. Um, so with that in mind, I don't want to spend too long talking about the Data Science Institute in general, but uh, it's part of my job to do so. Uh, so I'll just do a quick introduction. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the Data Science Institute, uh, our focus is quite different to typical academic uh, bodies and institutes in that we're primarily focused on real world collaboration with industry partners and working with those partners to deliver real impact. So that means a lot of our engagements are much shorter time frames. They're co-designed from the ground up with industry. Uh, we tend not to be um, so much in the ivory tower esoteric research space, more in the highly applied space. And that's that's really how we measure value for the work we do is is there real world impact. Um, we do that really across the the full life cycle of uh, the data innovation journey, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, just to give you a sense of who we are, um, there's around 40 full time researchers and engineers as part of the Data Science Institute. And the majority of those are working on applied industry and government facing projects. Uh, the majority of the research staff are full time in research, non teaching academic staff. Uh, it's it's always great to highlight uh, where we can uh, some awards that that really highlight the impact that we deliver out into the real world. So. Um, in addition to things like the Eureka Prize and the New South Wales Premier Prize for Science and Engineering, which are, are really fantastic um, awards that uh, represent being at the leading edge of data science um, in Australia, the, the things I'm most proud of are the fact the team has picked up awards in the National Intelligent Transport Systems, uh, FMA Accenture Innovation and Insurance, uh, multiple I awards, uh, National Research Innovation Awards in the water sector. And I guess what comes out from that is that 
those awards are industry focused. So they're not di data science awards, they're awards of delivering impact out into the real world and specifically in those spaces. And a big part of our team is delivering domain expertise that yes, includes data science and data innovation, but also comes with expertise in transport, water, energy, ag, health, finance, and more. So that's something I'm really proud of is that the group knows how to take those data science innovations and deploy them in practical ways with our domain partners. Um, if you flick to the next slide, Simona, um, this, is, this will be the, the last of um, what I will say, and then we'll talk a hand over to the much more interesting content. Um, but just to give you a sense of, uh, of where the Data Science Institute is focused, it really is across that full delivery pipeline. So we engage with partners all the way at the very start of opportunity discovery and assessment, and that includes um, organisations that are right at the beginning of the data maturity um, cycle, all the way through to really data mature organisations looking to fine tune existing product. Um, and then from there, it really is deploying a whole raft of different data science technologies. So that can be um, some of the more pragmatic data cleaning, hosting, preparation, uh, data analytics, so development of dashboards and the like, and really intuitive uh, and user-friendly ways. And we'll see actually a version of that with uh, the digital twin, um, all the way through to some of the more cutting edge approaches. So using deep learning for predictive analytics and forecasting, multi-objective optimization to, to balance future operational and current operational need. Um, and then we run all the way through to actual business and solution integration. So uh, we're not just um, a research organisation, we work also really closely with our industry partners to make sure that the products we develop actually get deployed and used within the organisation. And we've got lots of examples of operational systems that are underpinned now by technologies we've developed. So that's the Data Science Institute and really excited to to listen to this presentation. As Simona noted, please do feel free to ask questions both through the chat, but also at the end of this session, we'll have lots of time for live questions. If we run out of time, feel free to follow up with any of us offline. We're very happy to catch up. So thank you, Simona, and back to you. Thank you, Adam, um, for this presentation and introduction. And um, indeed, I'm actually very happy that you mentioned um, that the Data Science Institute is working a lot with industry partners. Um, it's basically uh, where we get our problems that come to us. And I think that's also one of the purpose for today is to open up the discussion to uh, any other sectors and any other people that are working in the digital twin or the real time data processing or into the advanced analytics or and really um, collaborate and provide feedback and um, yeah, open the door to to all sorts of opportunities. So inside the Data Science Institute that Adam has presented, there are multiple teams. Uh, some teams are working on water um, projects. Some uh, teams are working on energy projects. And uh, my team, uh, the UTS Future Mobility Lab, is working on problems that relate to transport, smart cities, um, and uh, air quality, and so on. So um, I can give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the projects and uh, works that we have done in the past. We do a lot of machine learning, either for predicting duration of traffic incidents or um, uh, risk um, uh, severity. We've applied all sorts of deep learning models for predicting the traffic flow, speed occupancy across motorways. Uh, we do a lot of simulation when the real time data is not there or when we need to build what if scenarios um, that can help uh, us answer some questions at all levels, macro, meso, micro. Uh, we also started doing the digital twins for a few years now, and you will see um, a little bit of that today. And of course, applied to um, public transport movement. We also worked a little bit to analyze the impact of COVID, a little bit on the road safety, the automatic star uh, rating with TomTom, Tom, IRAP, Transport Venus, Wells. 
um, and with AIMO on the impact of electric vehicles and so on. We are really passionate about it, all these topics that um, reflect how a smart city should work and how we should all have um, a better interconnectivity. So this is who we are in a nutshell. And the topic for today is really about digital twins. So you have probably heard this um, everywhere. Um, it's a very hot topic at the moment, and a lot of people are starting to research and investigate themselves into this one. So um, as a short intro for those of you that might wonder, what is exactly a digital twin? Well, the standard definition for that is really that a digital twin is a virtual representation of a real life system. Uh, and basically, um, we are building its counterpart in the digital world. So exactly the same components, the same movement that happens in the real life system. We are trying to capture that all of it digitally. Uh, and why should we actually even launch ourselves? Well, what is happening is that there is a huge uptake with regards to modeling and integrating all the data that we receive from our real life systems. And uh, this is kind of like the easy way to build what if testing scenarios for any type of system. Either we're talking train operation, power plant management, uh, staff uh, optimization across warehouses and so on. All of that you need to have like a, a digital replica of your entire plant or your entire warehouse in order to start making optimization algorithms and, and make better decisions to improve the flow and so on. So it's really about a way of not only representing what is happening, but also troubleshooting, a scenario testing and making better decisions when it, it comes to uh, future enhancements. What's happening so far is that really a lot of sectors have started to adopt digital twins. Probably the most um, common are the automotive uh, sector, the aerospace sectors, but it's actually starting to spread very fast across healthcare. All cities around the world have started to build their digital twins and they will do that even more in the upcoming years. The construction industry is actually also strong going into the digital twin modelings for buildings. But not only, either we're looking at the maritime sectors, energy uh, sectors, and so on. Everybody's kind, kind of trying to integrate all the data that they have with regards to their business or their system and have like one unique platform or digital model that they can capture all of these inter interdependencies. So really, building a digital twin is really it's about helping to make better decisions, improve the operations that you're doing into your business, and of course, um, uh, improving um, all sorts of uh, future decisions that uh, that need to be taken. Now, with regards to where are we heading at, and why is everybody so crazy about digital twins? Where um, at the government level, even uh, there is the environmental strategy that has been released until 2025. Uh, by the city of Sydney, where they actually one of the targets is to reach net zero emissions by 2035 on buildings and transport. But not only, they also want landfill reduction. They also want like um, um, a better interconnectivity with um, uh, the waste management and so on. So we're really getting closer to this kind of like circular economy concept in which everything that we see, touch and interact with needs to uh, provide a better outcome. So either we are looking at products that we use, um, either let's say rail tracks or vehicles or all sorts of components in 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 a specific system, trains and so on. All of that needs to be basically used. Um, and then recycled, and then of course reintegrating slowly, slowly into this cycle of utilization, recycling, and then putting back into production. So we're really looking at a new concept that is coming ahead. However, it's very hard, like um, to really capture all this interdependency. Like the transport sector in itself is one part of the puzzle, but you have as well the manufacturing sector. You might have uh, the the uh, the energy sector. These are all at the moment disconnected, so there's no connectivity. So that's why we actually started with uh, the approach of integrating multiple data streams into one kind of like digital twin platforms, uh, platform which can give us multiple insights across multiple um, domains. So um, how did we do that? By layering approach. So what you're going to see today is really based on um, a layering strategy which starts with the terrain 
adding the buildings, adding the infrastructure on top of that, the mobility, and of course the interconnectivity with all sorts of data streams that we need to consume in order to know what's happening. Um, around the world, I would like to say that there are um, uh, a lot of people that operate at uh, levels of zero, one or two of maturity. What does that mean? They mostly have like 2D or 3D models, uh, which can be interconnected sometimes even with BIM models and so on that they use for all sorts of simulations. However, what we have at the moment is really level three in which we are pumping data into the digital twin model that we're building and we are fueling it by by this this insight uh, that comes from the data itself. Our end goal eventually is to go to a level four or five, which is like complete autonomy of a digital twin, where the real system can uh, interact with the digital system and then basically it's kind of like a bi-directional model. However, level five of autonomy is very difficult and not even maybe at this stage impossible when we're talking about the entire city level. So that will be extremely hard to achieve. However, it can be done by uh, one of a subsystem of the digital twin model. Before getting into the background and the technical um, details, I would like to say that the digital twins are all about the data and the technology behind it. So either we're getting the data from sensors um, and actuators and so on, all of that data needs to be structured and needs to be separated, needs to be cleaned, uh, needs to be partitioned into subsets. Um, uh, so we might fuse some of the information that we have, we might discard others. So there's a lot of process of managing how this data comes into our hand and eventually all of that it's with the purpose of uh, preparing like the features um, select what we need and finally of course build our uh, optimization or prediction models so i mean by the time you really get to any sort of prediction there's a lot of path going through and then there's a lot of technology that needs to be adopted which each of these steps um i will then pass on to uh um, my colleague, uh, Yumi, and he can actually talk to you about the platform architecture. Yes, uh, so this uh, diagram shows the system architecture of the digital team we have development. So um, there are four layers, uh, including data connection layer, uh, analysis layer, and visualization layer, and uh, data API layer. So and the first one is the data connection layer. Is This layer is to use to connect the different data source like the transport data, parking data, and the air quality data and others. So with this data connection layer, our system can connect to the real-time data by a data API. And the system can also import the historic data in CSV format or other common formats. So um, that's the data connection layer. And the, the analytics layer is the engine to power the system and the components in this layer could be divided into three groups for different and uh, specific purposes. And one group is using the learning and machine learning to identify the patterns and emerging risk and also the critical events in real time. Uh, another group can uh, make the near term or long term prediction. And apart from that, uh, we also have a simulation components, which is to enable the what if scenario uh, analysis? So on top of the analysis layer, the visualization layer is the interface to enable the interaction with the system. So um, this layer presents the spatial temporary data and also the insights to the users. So the last one is the data API layer, which is to uh, expose the data and insights and general by the system so that the other system can be easily integrated with our system. So that's the um, architecture of our system. And if we move to another slide, yeah. Um, so this slide shows um, the, how the system connect to the data source using GTF, GTFS data as the example. The GTFS stands for the uh, General Changes Fee Specification, uh, which defines a common data format for publishing the public transfer data. So in our system, uh, there are three types of GPS data need to uh, connect, collect, including real-time trend position data, and trend timetable data, and the trend network data. So to connect the real-time trend position data, we have um, a data calling service, which sends uh, a data 
polling request to the data API every five seconds. So after receive the data, we will check the, the data. If the data is the same to the previous one, then we discuss discard the data. Otherwise, we will append the data to the database or a data file. So the other way, the way to connect the other two types of data are uh, quite similar, but with a uh, different frequency. Uh, for the time type of data, we uh, create the data on a daily basis. But for the uh, chain network um, of the data, um, the frequency could be much lower because uh, the data uh, doesn't change uh, very, very often. Yeah. So that's the um, how we claim the the data using uh, GDS data as an example. Um, next we'll demo the system. Um, Simla, uh, that's back to you. Yes. Um. So we will start and showing you the demo of the platform and what we have done so far. So what you have heard is only a few examples of the data crawling, but there's more coming in, and then maybe we can touch down. For those of you that really want to know more details, you can go to our webpage fmlab.org in the project section, and we have a description in there and some videos if you want to play them after after this um after this uh, meeting. Sorry. Let me just um, uh, stop my uh, presentation and then I will basically start um, talking about the digital twin platform and how we all started integrating. Um, in order to show you all the capability of the platform, because it's really um, a lot of, um, of functions and insights that needs quite a, a, a few large data stream. We're basically showing you today all the data streams that we have from yesterday, 16th of August, so that you can have a sense of what uh, what happened into the network and how we can actually use it to make informed decision. So. Um, this oh, the what we have actually chosen to show today not to overload the, the platform is basically the train network uh, movement so um just like yuming mentioned earlier this is crawled every five seconds from the gtfs uh, streams uh, from the open data hub and basically we can have insights of everything that is happening in the network now uh, one um, interesting thing that you can see on the network is that you will see some trains which are actually in a bubble. So this means that these trains are being delayed. So um, this is, for example, train T2, which um, we know the last stops. Where is it going? And the fact that it's actually six minutes late. So we can track down to see um, the performance of this train and then whether indeed it is keeping up or not. And of course, navigating inside the network to other parts um, um, of what is happening. Now we can also see the, the latest five delayed trains and of course, um, uh, go and check out what is happening. This one, for example, started at 801. It's actually a Leppington to City Circle via Granville. It's already six minutes late. So um, by the time uh, we we looked at it, so it's, it's really about seeing all of that. If um, the interface can get too much, because when you have a lot of entity moving, it can be overwhelming and hard to digest. We can actually just look at only the delayed trains, so we can filter like only those uh, trains with issues, I would say. Um, and we can actually have a look what has happened, for example, uh, with regards to its scheduling. So we can um, activate as well the scheduling function and we can compare. So, for example, this one um, that I know it's six minutes late, uh, which has the trip ID 33C, uh, it's actually see it was supposed to be here so it actually was supposed to be uh, one stop ahead that is where it was scheduled to be so we can actually look and see okay uh is it catching up or not do we have problems and so on so we can activate deactivate um the layers as we feel like and of course um we can also just look at one line only uh for the visualization or deactivate uh some lines that maybe we are not interested in. Uh, and one of the things that we're showing this is because we have introduced a feature um, into our network, which is really looking at um, a, like going further, um, like if, if we want to see how the train network or any type of 
uh, real-time uh, operation network has um, performed in, let's say, in a specific hour of the day. Like we can actually, from the database that we collected, we can go and play back everything that has happened throughout that hour. Uh, and then we can actually identify like, OK, where were the main issues or what what actually has happened overall? And we can see whether there is repetitive pattern or not. Uh, OK, let me put this a little slower. All right, um, it's a little bit fast. So one other thing is, of course, we can actually choose what hour we want to investigate and everything that has happened. Um, the other uh, thing, so um, the next part of one of the insights that we we thought of um, integrating is really the connection with the simulation tool. So we have actually uh, connected the SUMO, it's an open source traffic simulation model for incidents. So for example, yesterday there was an incident that was reported at 9.20 a.m. in the morning. And basically what we're doing at the moment, we are calling the simulation, so in the background, and the simulation model is actually um, calling all the train trip and we can actually do a fast forward um, of the train simulation, which will give us, for example, all the train that will do a train bunching um, across this station. Oh, I think I clicked too fast. <laughs> uh, the incidents cleared off by 10 a.m. So uh, basically uh, everything is back to normal. Uh, at Waverton, there, is, there was a big incident uh, which lasted actually for one hour. So this actually saw quite a lot of trains that have been um, stopped and waiting um, waiting uh, to, to actually get the green line to continue into the network. So with this type of um, kind of like connectivity between the data that you have and calling the simulation when you need it, you can actually predict in advance, OK, the next trains that are going to be affected are these ones. And we estimate that uh, they're going to have this one plus 50 minutes of delay because it's just uh, it's gonna, going to be blocked there without nowhere to go. Another um, thing that we wanted to show is actually the interconnection with um, the water data streams. So these are actually um, water pipes layout and sensors that we got from Sydney Water. Uh, this has been done under a, um, how should I say, um, a sensitive project uh, for which basically they are providing us data and we are crawling in the same way that we do for transport. We are crawling their data APIs for water. We can't give you insights. This is belongs to Sydney Water, but basically we have data streams that are really coming from from their side and we are building as well the, the advanced analytics with regards to uh, the, the, the flow in a specific time of the day. Eventually, if something happens, if, if a water pipe bursts here, let's say, and is going to be massive, then basically we will know like which trains at that particular moment in time are going to be affected or which buses and so on. Uh, moving next, we have added as well the air quality data. So this is actually from air quality stations across the city of Sydney. And basically we, we can... Um, see I mean how much was the PM10, uh, 2.5, wind direction and so much uh, and so on. Uh, when we have the bushfire episodes then basically we can create alerts with this one. Um, we don't have any of yet because the air quality these days it's pretty good but this can be powerful to see whether you you need to put alerts in specific areas of the city and with regards to the transport movement in that city. Um, I will basically talk about as well the 3D data um, functionality where we can uh, import and uh, visualize the 3D layout of the entire city, uh, the stations and so on. Uh, we are currently doing a project with regards to the integration of big models for smart buildings. Um, can't show you that yet, but if you want a demo on the smart building uh, digital twin, please feel free to get in contact and we'll be happy to talk about how we also did that integration. The whole idea is that each building that you see here can be replaced by highly functional BIM models, and then we can actually build all sorts of data streams into that and how it can actually interconnect with uh, anything that comes around it. And I think the last um, uh, feature that I would like to show and before passing over uh, to Bill is really the data stream that we had from the average system. So every system really pushes uh, in the same way uh, with the high frequency data. And one of them that we have chosen to showcase here is actually the parking data. 
Um, I think this is the Gordon station where T1 and T9 passes by. And basically, uh, we can receive um, real time streams of uh, how much was the occupancy at this um, park station, uh, which can be overlaid in parallel with the train uh, with the train. So let's say let's try to speed it up a little bit on what happened, for example, um, yesterday. So a lot of people are just starting to use the parking from 8 a.m. onwards, and I think the capacity of this um, the car a park is around 213 or something like that. So what it means that is um, uh, just before the morning peak of commuting time, what we estimate is that a lot of people come and drop their cars and then they take the train to go to CBD and like go on with, with their work. And what is happening is that this car park will be fully occupied throughout the day uh, and basically it will be um, at maximum capacity for until we noticed until the afternoon peak finishes. So this is kind of like, you know, that interconnectivity between parking data streams, transport streams, because we really, for example, you could nicely estimate like what is the demand for that specific train station, or for example, if you need more car park, or for example, if you need to place an electric vehicle charging station, what is the capacity in that area and how much more would you need, right? So really, I think it reached very fast its peak capacity and like there's no no more um, no more parking slots to go there. So I will just stop here. I know I, I took a little bit too much. Let me just um, maybe bring back uh, bring back my slides and uh, Bill. Um, I think I'm passing on to you now. So, so let me stop sharing. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Simona. Um, appreciate uh, that. Um, I should say from the outset that uh, my expertise is uh, not in transport or uh, digital twins. My background is in communications, networking and uh, IoT. Um, but the, the impetus for my new company is, is really a strong belief in both the need for and potential around IoT in, uh, in, in uh, real time. Our uh, work to date um, includes that with Transport for New South Wales, where we provided the uh, data update service to the Open Data Hub, uh, which is, as many of you know, the public uh, transport um, data portal maintained by uh, that department. We're collaborating with the, the Future Mobility Lab to prototype the addition of live streamed event data to the digital twin, providing an additional data sourcing layer for that. And um, I'm really excited by the, the work with UTS, which is really impressive and, and has such huge potential. Uh, this is very much a learning experience. We certainly don't have everything I'm going to be discussing at least uh, completely sorted. But I, I strongly believe that uh, it'll prove to be quite pivotal in this and, and other applications going forward. And my hope is that by sharing this, um, uh, we uh, can open the door to an expansion of that research and uh, commercial uh, outcomes for uh, my organisation. So let me just uh, turn on screen share and uh, start my part of the presentation, uh, which I'll now I'll now commence. Um, so, um, with the overview of the work at UTS, um, you'll hopefully be convinced that um, this is only possible through access uh, in, in a timely fashion to event-oriented uh, transportation and other data relating to what's happening in the real world. And in fact, it's uh, fundamental to moving to level three of the, uh, the Atkins maturity model that Simona presented. Uh, that's very easy to say, but there are many, many underlying challenges and sourcing data from uh, a broad array of sources is not trivial. In fact, aggregating uh, diversely sourced uh, data in real time is, is downright uh, hard and traditional methods don't really cut it um, and, and are not scalable. So there are gaps in pulling the feeds together required to power the digital twin. And, and this, in essence, is the work that um, uh, we are uh, 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 in the process of, of delivering. So today, uh, unless you uh, uh, let, let me just um, move on to the, the slide here. So um, uh, the uh, traditional approach um, um, is um, the, the um, 
uh, unless you operate the data source itself, um, here's how it's typically done. Um, and that's through through the, the harvesting of uh, data uh, from databases. Uh, I'll use an exa as an example um, data published by Transport for New South Wales, which I think is typical. Um, APIs enable an application developer to download data sets for post-processing. And this is fine for, for things like transport timetables. They don't usually change continuously. Uh, for, say, a travel planning app, um, you might uh, perhaps do this daily, but if the data changes second by second, minute or even even hour, uh, as in transport's case, uh, current vehicle uh, position information is stored in frequently updated binary uh, files, um, the file must be uh, repeatedly downloaded and passed by a client for uh, changes. And needless to say, this is uh, quite cumbersome and, and time consuming. And that's just uh, one data source. Uh, what if you need uh, road traffic information? You add in the complexity of uh, uh, of all of that, and the problem becomes uh, really exceedingly difficult. So here's a different approach, uh, one which we're employing, where data snippets, uh, objects as they're sometimes called, are streamed in real time to a central repository, which becomes a point of aggregation for a variety of data. So vehicle tracking systems, uh, We'll, we'll continue to save position feeds to proprietary databases. Um, so uh, what if in, in addition they stream uh, real time, uh, relatively small snippets of information to such an exchange? And if, if all providers of interest, be they uh, public transport, parking facilities, roads and so on, take this approach, uh, the challenges for the uh, potential consumers of this information diminish significantly. Uh, you then have a consistent way for clients, be that uh, a digital twin, travel planning apps, uh, or, or whatever, to utilise the same infrastructure to derive uh, real-time information in a consistent way. And importantly, that uh, ease of access will hopefully lead to an explosion in the use of data. So coming back to digital twins specifically, uh, what, if, uh, what this enables is the creation of a streamlined data pipeline uh, to power that. Um, an exchange layer can provide uh, a consistent foundation for supplying objects to the analytics and presentation layers, uh, the objects conveying the states of entities of interest in real time. And this in is indeed what our, our work offers as a growing foundation for the Transport Digital Twin at UTS. So uh, the exchange layer can and, and really ought to provide a number of capabilities. Uh, first and foremost, access control and, uh, and management encompassing security. Uh, to control who has access to the data and under what terms they have uh, that access. Uh, you really require straightforward physical access to data using common uh, methods, for example, the standardised publish subscribe uh, protocols, um, ideally consistent naming and addressing schemes for the data, uh, analogous uh, perhaps to the internet's uh, a domain name service, and along with that, directory services enabling consumers to explore and discover available data through cataloging and search. Um, aiding the uh, understanding and interpretation of the, the semantics or meaning of the data by means of a way to catalog and link data models to the data itself is, is vitally important. And lastly, uh, data persistence and retention. Uh, enabling, for instance, the initialization of a digital twin uh, with the current state of the world. So back to how this fits with uh, the UTS Future Mobility Labs digital twin. We call our implementation of such a data exchange TIFF, the Internet Work for Things, and it fills a critical gap in building and operating digital twin. In fact, a wide variety of uh, uh, other IoT related applications, and that gap, of course, being the aggregation and management of streams of real time information. So let me open the lid and show you briefly how this works. Events are published to the exchange in real time and is applicable to this digital twin. This includes streams of parking facility occupancy. Um, applications uh, as subscribers connect to TIFF through a streaming API and receive those continuous feeds in, in real time. And by retaining uh, time stamped um, data objects, when the twin starts up, for instance, the current known positions of all vehicles can be retrieved as a complete set. So as such, the data flow looks uh, looks like this. As these things evolve, um, we'd expect uh, data providers to stream directly to such exchanges, and certainly that's something we're agitating for. 
but in the meantime, by means of separate processes, we, uh, we've uh, software which continuously scans and analyzes sources to create streams of these real-time events, which are then published to TIFT. In the current implementation, real-time occupancy data for park and ride car parks um, is, is ingested by the digital twin, complementing other data, including uh, train positions and service disruptions. So let me show you this in action by means of recordings of the, the TIFF management console. Uh, here you see a channel uh, comprising the streams of occupancy events for uh, uh, parking facilities in Sydney. And these individual events or messages consist of structured data, which uh, you can see displayed for each message. Um, amongst the various uh, data embedded in the message uh, is the, the current occupancy for the facility in question. And, and an event uh, in this case will correspond to a change in that figure, i.e. vehicles entering or leaving a facility. Uh, similarly, for the streams of real-time vehicle positions, that's trains, buses, ferries, and so on, um, here's a channel carrying uh, streams of position change events. And this data structure is a little more complex, but uh, fundamentally uh, includes uh, the vehicle uh, IDs, trip IDs, the vehicle's geographic location and so on. And uh, the data structure here is in fact a GTFS entity which has just changed. So for each of these streams, uh, a data schema is associated, a data model, and, and that can be viewed elsewhere in the console which in, aids uh, consumers in interpreting the data. So what follows in the last uh, uh, two or three slides here are several views of uh, Another console management page uh, displaying some statistics for various channels. And this first one shows uh, vehicle position change events for various transport modes in Sydney. Uh, that is the, the event counts for trains, light rail, ferries and so on, minute by minute over an hour. Um, here's another view um, of pretty much the same data. These are vehicle position changes hour by hour over a full day. And, and interestingly, you can start to see uh, a daily pattern with activity peaks during the morning and late afternoon. And finally here, um, event counts for car park occupancy over four full weeks with, with the weekly activity patterns evident. And since these are streams of events that correspond to occupancy changes, uh, this is effectively uh, a display of the activity level of the car parks themselves. Uh, the exchange doesn't attempt to provide analytics uh, since that'll be highly dependent upon the data itself, but these are management views for users of, of the exchange. So I'll just uh, turn off um, screen share here. Um, and um, just to, to, to say in closing that um, we're really, um, very, uh, very happy and, and appreciative of everybody a, a attending. And I hope this has provided a useful overview of, of an important piece of uh, the digital twin data flow. And we at the company were very open to uh, collaboration with other data providers um, and uh, uh, application developers, not necessarily limited to transportation, would certainly welcome any uh, subsequent discussions. So I'd now like to hand back to you, Simona. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, just to wrap up, um, we are just one maybe last thing to say is that we would like to hear from you. Like, where do you see that the digital twin can interconnect with other domains? Either is the you know energy sector, either is the logistics, asset management, building management, or you know like some sort of waste, any type. So we would like to discuss uh, today like what where do you think that could play a role and basically uh yeah if you're working in that domain would love to know more um keep in touch with us like uh, uh, contact us anytime all the time um if you have questions we're happy to do a follow-up even after the seminar and then of course answer maybe who knows uh, more curiosities um, what I will do now, I will stop the recording and then open the floor to open uh, Q&A stations, which I've seen there are quite a few in the chat.